mean, I don't need to use it, but I think people people want the recording. Oh, so Chris is on her way. No, I know this is a mic, but I move a lot. So, so I need the, the mobile thing. Um, Chris is on her way, and she should be here shortly. It's OK. You can come in. I haven't started. Did she say that I was going to be here? No? Did she say anything? Did you guys pay attention? Okay, guys, um, sorry to interrupt. I've, I'm just going to start. Lady with the glasses in the back row. I'm going to start. No, it's okay. So um, I don't know how many of you know that I was going to present today. Um, Chris, um, as you know, your main lecturer, um, asked me to give this lecture. I'm, I work mostly on techno-economic analysis. I don't know how much you know about techno-economic analysis. Hopefully not a lot, um, and then I can teach you something. Um, in general, I spend about half the time in uh, the US and about half the time in Australia. So I work at this institute in the US called the Joint Bioenergy Institute. Uh, most of what we do is biofuels or bioenergy related stuff. And I do um, economic analysis of different biofuel alternatives. So I'll be talking to you about that today. You have the handouts. Uh, you probably have the slides. If you have questions, you should ask me. I'm a very nice person, I promise. I won't think that you're stupid. Um, and yeah, that's it. And then at the end of the lecture, I was thinking if I have time, I will cover some other topic that probably is more interesting to you than this. But I'll start, um, and that's Chris over there, obviously. Of course. I do have a PhD. <laughs> Please do. Yeah, I will. Like yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Do you have the mic? I do. That, that was my only... Very dynamic And asking questions? <laughs> well, I'm actually three months pregnant. So <laughs> it doesn't show. Uh, so how, how are you today? Yeah. Good? Pero ¿por qué lo tienes tú? ¿Por qué lo tienes tú? Lo estuve buscando. ¿Que te lo dan a ti? Ah, está, te ve. No te preocupes, no lo que. Eu só vou fazer o set, então é assim, ó. Primeiro tu liga. Ok. Então eu tenho. Ah, Primeiro okay. eu tenho que fazer o set, isso aqui. Okay. Should I turn this on? If 
Yeah. Now they can just pick on that. Eu deveria. Tá vendo? Eles não estão mudando. E eu tenho que colocar esse, esse, tele, esse número aqui. Pelo menos estão todos os deditos. Eu acho que com o teu timbre de voz eles vão conseguir pegar de qualquer ah. jeito, tá? Ok, então eu não vou usar o microfone. É como. Não funciona. Eu acho que você pode me ouvir. Se você está aqui, você está aqui. Se você não está aqui. Muito bem. Too bad. I think you can, you can, I usually have a loud voice. Yeah, if you speak loud, loud the ones that are at home, they shouldn't be at home, they should be here. Okay, so let's get started. Um, you've seen this before, right? You've seen this diagram before. Pretty much what it says is you have biomass, you have biofuels. There is many different things that you can do to make uh, biofuels from biomass. And I won't talk about all of them today, but uh, I, won't, I will talk about a few. Uh, I think that Chris covered a couple, so sugar base, for example, to ethanol, whatever it is uh, here, and then uh, lignocellulosic to ethanol and so on. So the first one that I'd like to talk about is corn ethanol. Um, how many of you know where corn ethanol is produced? America? Yeah. So the US is the number one producer of biofuels in the world, right? What's number two? Who's number two? Uh, Brazil, most of biofuel that comes from Brazil is from, okay. So you know a lot about biofuel. Maybe I should just go back to the US. Um, so so the, the idea for biofuels from corn is, or for biofuels in general, is that you have the energy of the sun, you capture it in some sort of plant material, and then you process the plant material into ethanol, and then you burn that CO2, and the CO2 goes back to, to the cycle. So the idea is that that's why it's renewable. So um, can somebody give me an idea of why it's not a good idea to uh, let's just one at a time. It's hard for me to do that. Okay, that's one. And another one. Takes up a lot of space. Um, land, you mean? Yes. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a good one. Is there any process to But that's the, that's the problem not of using corn, that's the problem of using ethanol. Uh, it requires lots of fertilizer. Yeah, that's another good point. No, no, it is. Nice to do some problems. Anyway, so, so that's, the, that's one of the things. It, it, this is a waste, pretty much, right? So you can uh, take agricultural waste and then use that to produce biofuel, and that doesn't completely change. So that's the idea. The problem with using lignocellulosic biomass is that, um, how many of you know what this is? Any idea? Any safety? No, this guy. This guy is strong. This guy? Yeah, that's yeast. Okay, so this is the yeast that we use to make bread and, uh, and beer and all the nice things that humans consume. Uh, but the problem is 
the yeast doesn't take you know, the lipid bio biomass. So you can't actually ferment the biomass like, like it is. So you have to process it, right? You have to process it to look something like this. Who knows what this is? Yeah, that's glucose. And then glucose actually can be taken by yeast and you can produce um, ethanol. So that's pretty simple. Uh, the problem is obviously that uh, you need to make the glucose first. So what you do is you take the lignocellulosic biomass, you, dis you do something called pretreatment, and I think you have covered pretreatment, right? More or less. You were asleep at the time, but you covered pretreatment. And um, what you do is you release the, the sugars, the pretty much the sugar polymers, and then uh, you can hydrolyze them using enzymes. So the enzymes look more or less like this. Um, which is actually a very nice picture of an enzyme. Um, and then what you do is you take the polymers, you um, monomerize the polymers with enzymes, and now you, want, you have the monomers that, uh, uh, that, can be that, that can be used to produce ethanol. So this is more or less what the pathway for ethanol production looks like in yeast um, from glucose. Uh, you don't have to remember this, but this is, you know, if you're going to go to biochemistry or something, this is pretty much what you're going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, are all of you chemical engineers? or aspiring, I guess, chemical engineers. Somebody wasn't very positive on the chemical engineering thing. Do you want to share? It's OK. We'll have a space for that. So the idea is you take the corn stover, which is pretty much the agricultural waste after corn is done, and you do something called feed handling. What you do in feed handling is you, um, you cut it in very small pieces. Does somebody know why you would want to cut it in small pieces? One at a time. Sorry? It increases surface area? Yeah, so it increases sur surface area. Actually, it increases the surface area to volume ratio. So once you increase the surface area, it's much easier to do everything else, uh, in particular solubilization, which is pretty much the most expensive part of the process. And then you can ferment it, uh, and then you do distillation, and then you recycle the water. And those solids, which is the lignin mostly, is what you use to fuel the process. So this process is actually much better in terms of energy than the corn ethanol or uh, the, the corn ethanol process or wheat ethanol or whatever it is. Um, now, somebody else, and I forgot whom, said that ethanol is not very dense. I don't remember who said that. That was a good point, which is pretty much what this graph is showing, right? So you have gasoline here, which is what we use mostly for cars, gasoline and diesel. And you have ethanol here. So what's the problem with having a low energy density So pretty much diesel and gasoline and all these things that we use from oil are very, very good, uh, very good batteries, actually. It's a very good way of storing energy. It's hard because now we have to compete with them if you want to make something renewable, but they are actually very good. So ethanol is not so good. Something that looks like gasoline or diesel are actually very good. So what we can do is we can look at metabolism as it occurs in nature, and we can say, Let's look at something else that a cell would make that looks like gasoline and see if we can produce it. So that's what the field of synthetic biology and metabolic engineering tries to do. And that's pretty much what I did my PhD on. And I hated it, so um, I changed later. But this is pretty much what I used to do in my PhD. So the idea is you take the sugars, glucose, silos, or whatever, and then you produce acetyl-CoA. Then from acetyl-CoA, you can produce many other molecules. And some of them look amazingly like uh, gasoline and jet fuel and some of the same chemicals that we use today. So for example, terpenoids look a lot li like jet fuels. Uh, butanol look, looks a little bit like gasoline. Um, the fatty acids look like diesel. So actually, metabolism provides a lot of solutions for this problem. One of the main problems with that is that organisms don't like to produce these kinds of chemicals. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, for the time being, that's fine. What, what I want to say more is that the fact that metabolism is so rich and so flexible allows us to get many more routes than what you see here. So for example, you can take sugar and then ferment it directly into something that looks like a biodiesel. Um, and that's actually a very cool technology. Another thing that you can do is to gasify um, lignocellulosic biomass. 
Does somebody know what syngas is? So it, what, does somebody know what gasification is? You, you don't have to know. Don't feel that you should. But, uh, it would be amazing if somebody knew. So gasification is pretty much a process where you take usually coal or biomass and you put it in a very uh, hot furnace with no oxygen. Now, why wouldn't you want to put oxygen? What happens if you put oxygen? Yeah. Yeah. So combustion is pretty much a very uh, rapid oxidation of any carbon or any a flammable material, pretty much. What you do in gasification is you remove the oxygen, and what that produces is a, something called a syngas, which is pretty much carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And you can actually ferment that gas with a microorganism to produce uh, ethanol. So that, those are actually very cool technologies. I'm not going to go into the detail of all the different things that you can do um, with this sort of technology, but I've actually put in your handouts this slide. Uh, these are a few routes and a few uh, companies that do that. Um, if you're smart, one day you probably are going to work for one of them. They're all very good companies, and I can give you more detail uh, if, you're, if you want them. Um, now, this is what JBay is doing. So the JBay is the institute where I work. And what we're trying to do is to do lignocellulosic biomass, do pretreatment, do fermentation, and then turn it into something that looks like gasoline. So we want to bypass all the problems that you see that there's a huge divide here, right? And that is because the cellulosic biomass is good for some things, not good for other things. Uh, sugars are good for some things, not other things. Oils are good for some things, not other things. What we want is to take cheap lignocellulosic biomass and make something that looks like a biodiesel, which is uh, very, very challenging. So it, it looks actually like this. You take the biomass, again, you do the pretreatment, you do the enzymatic sacrification to make sugar from the fibers, and then you use microbes that have been engineered, and you produce uh, something that looks like a gasoline. So that's good. So let's talk about advantages of biofuels in general. Um, you already gave me a few, so I won't talk too much about this. The first is that feedstock is available. So, you know, it's waste resources. Uh, there was a famous study in the U.S. about, oh, here, in 2005, that calculated that there's about 1.3 billion tons of biomass to use, as, to, to use for biofuels. And this is non-food biomass. So this is a lot, of, a lot of biomass. And that's only the U.S. So, Potentially, we could make a lot of biofuel from that. So it's widely available. It can be carbon neutral if you're smart about how you make it. Um, you can start implementing it soon, which is another very big thing. Um, and then, as I said before, chemical bonds are very good for storage. So there's a lot of companies now, or a lot of technologies based on batteries. Um, and I'm a huge supporter of batteries. The problem is that the carbon, uh, the, the energy density is actually pretty low. And then another good thing is that they fit very well with developing economies because you don't need smart infrastructure. Does somebody know what smart infrastructure is? You're going to hear that term a lot in the news in the, few, in the next few years. Any ideas? Somebody know what the smart grid is? So if one of the problems, for example, of wind and solar energy is that you produce it, but you can't store it, right? So uh, the electricity market is pretty much a spot market. You produce it and you have to use it right away because there's really no to store it. So if you, uh, if you start putting things like uh, solar and wind, you don't control the sun and you don't control the wind, right? So you need computers that are very smart to direct where the energy is produced, where the energy is consumed. And you, that's pretty much what a smart grid is called. Now, the chances that a country like choose your developing economy, like Guatemala is going to have a smart grid in the near future is zero. So you want something that is more or less compatible with the infrastructure, like fire. Does that make sense? Any questions? No? Clear? Okay. So and that, another good thing is that it fits, it fits well with the business model of, uh, of oil giants. And the reason that that's good is that oil giants are pretty much the only companies in the world that have enough money to develop these kinds of things. So there's two entities that could develop this, either governments or oil companies. And sometimes, uh, most of the time, oil companies have more money than governments. So you know, it's actually good that that fits with, with them. Um, and also, po for political reasons, biofuels are good. For example, farmers really like biofuels. Um, one of the disadvantages. It uses water, fertilizer, and land. You both guys uh, over there, I don't know your names. You don't have to tell me your names. Um, you cover that. And then 
one of the disadvantages is actually the internal combustion engine is, is actually quite inefficient. That's changing, but compared to an to a, um, electric car, the, the in, internal combustion engine is actually pretty bad. The other problem is that the grain derived, um, like corn ethanol or wheat ethanol, uh, have very questionable carbon balance. What we were saying before, you need a lot of energy to actually do the distillation and the refining. And then I actually put as a disadvantage that it fits with oil giants as well. Can somebody give me an idea of why that could be a disadvantage? Not necessarily that it's a good thing. So, and then it's disfavored by some constituencies as well. And the main issue, in my opinion, and the reason that you know most of the talk is going to be about economic analysis, is that we can't compete with with oil. Pretty much that is the reason that that we don't see actually biofuels in the pumps. So when we go and we you know we go to Shell or whatever, we don't have an option of buying biofuel because it's not profitable for them to distribute it, right? So this is pretty much the question, fossil fuels versus biofuels. If the oil company can make, uh, sorry, it costs to them $1 to produce it and thousands to produce the other one, you can see why they wouldn't produce biofuels, right? So that's pretty much a simple question. Economics is, is, uh, is, the, main, is the main driver. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pay attention to it because as pretty much we've done with every other technology in the past, research and development has actually lowered the cost of production. So everything from computers to uh, gene sequencing to transistors to anything, to telephones, um, our research and development has actually lowered the cost of production. So it's actually a good thing that we are working on it. And I can tell you that in the past, I don't know, five years or so, there's so many more jobs for working on these technologies just because uh, everybody recognizes that we actually need to work on this problem. So if you look at the supply chain, so it, go, it starts with farming and it, sen it ends with blending. Uh, there is many different technologies that you can input in order to lower the cost of production. So um, the idea actually of techno-economic analysis is to study how or what is the impact of these technologies in lowering or increasing the cost of production. So that's pretty much what I do for a living. Um, it's actually fun sometimes, and sometimes it's a little bit too politically charged. So, so you may or may not like that. Um, and I center in biofuel production, and I think if you actually go into that, you will center in biofuel production because chemical engineers are usually more centered in this type, in this part of the process. So, as I said, techno-economic analysis is pretty much a blend of engineering, business, and economics. I should say that most of what I do is business and engineering. I do just very little economics, but, you know, there's other people who do more economics. And what it allows you to do is to get information, for example, about capital and operating cost of a facility. Um, so does somebody know what the difference between capital and operating costs are? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So the analogy that I usually use, which I like, is if you want to buy a dog, the dog is a capital cost and the food and the vaccinations are the operating cost. That's easy. And then I don't know what the revenue would be. But, um, but that's a different story. So you can also get information about what's the energy usage of the plant, uh, about what the impact of new technologies is. And this is actually most of what I do. Uh, you can see, for example, what waste and emissions are uh, for the facility. And then you can do something called life cycle analysis that I won't cover at all. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard this, but it's not relevant for this. And then you can do process flows, which again, I'm not going to cover. So the idea 
mostly what, what techno-economic analysis is used in research is that you have a process that looks more or less like that, and then you ask the academic community to come up with ideas of how to reduce the cost of production. And they usually come up with too many ideas. So every scientist has a different idea, and they say theirs is the one that's going to solve the problems. Um, and usually ne it's never the case. But you need tools that allow you to actually choose what areas are the ones that you should innovate on. Uh, so for example, when Apple does innovation, they don't you know, take the ideas of every single person and say, well, maybe we should do that. They have cost models, and they put everything into their cost models, and they come up with a return on their, ener on their research investment, and then they determine whether they should go ahead or not. Um, and those are two examples, by the way. These are not the answers to any of the modeling that I do or anything. Um, but this is more or less what we do and why, why we do it. So the idea is actually to solve a systems problem. Does somebody know what a systems problem is? Yes? Yeah, it does have to do with optimization. But, but a systems problem, OK, so that's one. You're talking now about the mass of it. Before then, does somebody have any idea what defines a systems problem? Yeah. Exactly. So, so if there is interconnection, so for example, you can be a specialist in fermentation, and the only thing that you will look is fermentation. The problem is obviously fermentation has an effect in saccharification, which has an effect in physical quality, and so on. And what the economic analysis does is instead of looking at the particulars, we try to step back and use optimization from the mathematical standpoint to find how how do these different parts interact, and that's pretty much most of what, what the models do. Now, we work with models. And what happens when, we, when you work with models, and this is not only true for the models that we work with, but any time that anybody works with models, the results depend on the assumptions that you make. So if you read the news, for example, and you see that such and such model determines that whatever, I mean, that uh, after 90% dead, the economy goes to a stop, for example, then you know that the result of their model goes into the assumptions. The problem is anybody can make whatever assumptions they, they want. So in the future, if you read of the results of a model, you should take that into consideration. You should ask yourself whether the assumptions look realistic or not. Because if you give me whatever result you want, I can fit my assumptions to give you the result that you want. And that's kind of important in general. So if you go to your bank, for example, and they say, well, if you invest in this super, we project that you're going to be rich in 35 years. Don't take it for granted. Ask them what was the assumption to, to make that determination. Otherwise, you're going to be poor in 35 years, and it's going to be too late. So what we try to do is to make our assumptions available in a wiki so that everybody can see the assumptions. Uh, and you can go to this wiki. You don't have to. But if you're interested in what we're doing, this is pretty much where to find it. So pretty much if you will continue doing chemical engineering, there is going to be a point that you're going to do process engineering. And the idea of process engineering is to do more or less uh, economic analysis at the end of the day. So what you will need is to know, for example, what raw materials you're using. You will need information about what it is that you're trying to produce for your particular process. And then information about, for example, utilities and the loans and taxes and labor and royalties. And all that information goes into the, into the analysis. And at the end of the day, it's actually very simple. What you do is actually you solve the material and energy balances, and then you do cost estimation based on that. So it's actually not very complicated. It looks much more complicated than it is. Um, does somebody know what material and energy balances are? I would hope. Yes. OK, so you've seen that before. So this is, this is the easy part. This is actually easier, but the, the hard part is actually to, uh, to put everything together and to communicate it in a way that people that are not chemical engineers are going to understand it. Um, and then you also have to know a lot about the biology, uh, because there's, most of these processes are biology-based. Uh, uh, any questions so far? No? OK. So the procedure in general is to get experimental and literature data, and then you get what's called industry best practices, and you choose the process parameters based on whatever uh, it is that you're going to do. And then you solve the material energy balances, and you do the cost estimation. Uh, and then with that, you do something called cash flow analysis. Somebody know what cash flow analysis is? Yes? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's pretty much it. So, so a cash flow analysis allows you to know whether a business is a good idea or is it a terrible idea or is it an okay idea. And that's pretty much what we are doing because the, business, the, the processes that we are uh, hoping to construct will become businesses at some point. So that's where the interaction between the business side and the engineering side come. And then I'll talk quickly about uh, techno-economic analysis that we have done about uh, some JBA technologies. And then I want to talk to you about something completely uh, unrelated to this, but maybe you're going to, uh, to benefit more, I think, um, in general. So, so, this, so what we do is we start with a base case. So you always start with a base case model, uh, which means you try to guess what is the most likely scenario that you're going to have, which is usually called baseline or benchmark. And in this case, we took a corn stover to ethanol. So this is lignocellulosic biofuel. And these are more or less the, the, uh, the technologies that we use inside the process. Um, again, this looks like it looked before. So this hasn't changed. And then you start putting um, assumptions about what, uh, what the different subparts or unit operations are going to do. So do you guys know about unit operations in general? Have you heard that term before? You will hear it many times in chemical engineering. So a unit operation is pretty much each part of the process that results in a bigger process. So for example, distillation is a unit operation or um, fermentation is a unit operation. So you actually have to model all the unit operations that go into the facility. So you have to guess or uh, based on what other people have done, you have to say, well, this is what the process will look like. And in this case, these are the different sections. But you see, for example, fermentation has many unit operations. These are all fermenters. This is a fermenter. This is a blending tank, and so on. And you have to specify what happens inside all of them. And then the software pretty much spits out an answer uh, after solving the material and energy balances. So everything is software-based these days. But the trick is to know what to put into the models. As a, again, that's pretty much the, what the results are going to depend on. And then these are pretty much the results of, of that model that you saw. This is kind of an old model, but it serves for the purposes of this. And you get information uh, about, for example, what the throughput of the facility in this case is 31 million gallons per year. Uh, you get information about the yield, which is the gallons of uh, fuel per ton of, uh, of feedstock produced. And then you get information about the economics. So for example, the total project investment needed is $337 million. So it's a sizable investment. Usually people don't go ahead and say, well, I'll put a couple, you know, $337 million. Um, and then once you take this into account, the operating cost and so on, you get a minimum methanol selling price of $4.58 per gallon. So that pretty much tells you why we don't have biofuels today. So if, you're, if you have a gallon, I mean, I don't know, probably you think in liters, right? Yeah. So um, this would be like 1.25 or 1.3, more or less, or 1. Point, yeah, around. So that is at the refinery gate. So you still have to put taxes, and you still have to transport it, and you still have to market it, and you still have to return. So this is the minimum. You still have to return something to your investors, right? So that is really the reason why we don't have biofuels. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we will never have biofuels. It just need, means that you need to do something to lower the cost of production. So what we did is we then studied different technologies, and these are just uh, a few technologies that actually people in my institute are working on. And we asked the question, what is the impact on the cost of production? And this is the difference in the minimum methanol selling price. So for example, a plant that has low lignin, and I'm not going to go into the details about why unless you're super interested, uh, which I doubt. Um, a plant that has low lignin actually has a big effect in lowering the cost of production. So that's, for example, one technology that now people are commercializing because it has such a big impact in lowering the cost of production. So um, do you guys know what a venture capital, is, uh, venture capital in general is? So, so you probably don't know too much about financing, but if you want to start a new business in general, there's different ways that you can start a new business. You can ask the bank for a loan. Uh, you can ask your rich friend for money. Um, or if you have a very new technology, you ask venture capitalists for money. So what they do is you have an idea, they have the money, they fund your company, uh, and then they get a big chunk of the company if it's successful, or even if it's not. So Google, for example, uh, was funded by venture capitalists. They invested a stupid amount of money, like 100000 uh, and now they are trillionaires. 
So venture capital is actually what makes that possible. This information is mostly used to go and ask a venture capitalist for money. So you have a new technology. Let's say you have a, a new plant that has low lignin. You go to a venture capitalist and you say, this is the market. If I use this technology, I'll lower the cost of production by a dollar per gallon. And they usually say, this is amazing. We, you know, we really like you, so on and so forth. They take you out to dinner. And then you become a millionaire, pretty much. So um, another thing that you can learn from doing this many times is that you start learning trends about what actually affects the, mi the minimum selling price. So in this case, the yield, in this case defined as ethanol produced per biomass use, you see that it has a huge effect on the cost of production. Not only that, you see that at the beginning of the curve, there is a big impact, and then it starts tapering off. So um, does somebody, well, first of all, can somebody tell me why yield should be important? Or what would result in yield being important? Any hypothesis is good. Yes. So you produce more using the same amount of pixels. I give you that part. Can somebody work on that to build the next line of the argument? Uh, somebody, yes. And you would need as much energy to do this. So that's the same idea, right? You use the same the same amount of pixels. So what 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 is that implying? The guy behind. Sure, that, that's from the profit side, but what is that implying about this product? If I, if I can produce more ethanol using the same amount of feed stock, this is saying something about what my costs are, right? Are you saying it's more like efficient? We're all saying the same thing. It's more efficient, you get more profit, um, you use less energy, and uh, you make more ethanol. All of them are the same argument. Why? Okay, that's the first line of the argument. It, it's all correct. What does that imply about the cost of feedstock? Uh, lower production costs. Mm, okay, go further with that. Okay, this is not a guessing game. If you if you show <laughs> a new idea, I'll just tell you. And I just destroy the presentation. So it, it's not so obvious, but it, it actually, if you think about it a little bit, you will see that if the single most important thing is how much ethanol you produce per unit of biomass, that implies that most of the cost is the cost of biomass, right? So, not, so, so pretty much you, you, you could have guessed that most of the cost of production is gonna be the cost of biomass, which is actually what you get. So you don't need to know that much in order to know what the structure, the cost structure of this facility is. And that has many other ramifications. For example, if I know that, and somebody comes and says I wanna start a new facility, I say, the first thing is, how much are you going to pay for your feedstock? Because that's really what's going to determine the selling price, right? Does that make sense? That's why these are the sort of things that work. So if you think, if you think like a business person and you have the skills of a chemical engineer, then you need to start asking those sorts of things. Um, the other thing that you learn when you do the analysis, which is not necessarily obvious, is that enzyme costs are actually very high. So this is an oversimplification, so the cost of enzyme goes 17%. If you actually have a more realistic estimate for the enzyme, the cost of production goes up to about 550 per gallon, or 940 per gallon of gasoline equivalent. So again, this is the reason why we don't have biofuel today. Uh, there is actually a few instances in which biofuels from the genetic material are being profitable today, but they need tax incentives and they need a few other things to make it work, uh, which were not included in the analysis. So in conclusion for this particular aspect is you need simpler processes because $337 million is nothing, somebody can't do the profit. Um, you need cheaper enzymes, as I said, and you need more efficient solubilization and fermentation which pretty much increases yield. So are there any questions? Yeah, everything's clear? Clear as mud? Okay, I'm happy with that. Um, so you can email me if you have questions. There is one other topic that I want to discuss before I let you go. Actually, I can let you go. I'm going to tell you what I want to discuss, and then whoever doesn't want to stay can leave, and whoever wants to stay can stay. 
Um, and that is something that I do when I teach class in the US, which is say, at some point, and we discuss about uh, careers in chemical engineering, about whether you have thought about it or not, and if you have discussion. Um, I have learned that usually there is no, um, it's usually not, it's never too early to start thinking about that. Um, because if you don't think about it, you will have to think about it at some point. So I'm more than happy to answer questions about chemical engineering in general. Um, I actually read a paper today, and you should know that, you can still leave after I say that, but um, I read a paper today, and the, the youth unemployment uh, rate is about 310 million people. So the population is like the population of the United States. So it's a big problem, and I can tell you that chemical engineers are in very good demand. So I think you're making a good choice, but I think you, it's not something that's particularly easy. So I'd be happy to answer questions about that. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions about what the US is doing in bioenergy or anything else. You don't have to uh, say if you don't want. We can have a, just a relaxed conversation with whoever it is. So, and I'm not going to tell Chris who left us. So, <laughs> you can just go. Any questions? That's good. I'm sure you're sure about what you're going to do, so that's good. No questions? Yeah, you can just stay. Whoever wants to stay, just, I mean, whoever wants to leave, just leave now so that we can all stay and then have a conversation. <laughs> okay, so I guess everybody's staying. Uh, so, any questions? Any <laughs> guys, look, I'm offering you a free service here. Usually it takes, you know, when I was when I was your age, I was very. I, I'm still confused about what I want to do, but um, but I'm older, so it's not acceptable to say it. Yeah. So it's a lot about like when you're kind of like you know, you're all about doing these processes and like um, you know figuring out kind of the wider scheme of how everything's going to work. If you become a chemical engineer or like you know biological engineer, do you also do a lot of kind of re direct research and development? Yeah, so, so it depends whether you, do, you want to do it in academia or in industry, right? So there's pretty much those two avenues to do what you're saying. If you do it in industry, they will probably assign to you a part of the process if you want to specialize, for example, in fermentation. So there's fermentation engineers that do that. And the only thing that they do is look at fermentation, they become very good at it, and then, you know, pretty much they, even if they lose uh, or, or they move from one job, they're going to get a new job in fermentation engineering. So that's one way in, the, in, in companies. If you want to do it in academia, you can do it usually in the chemical engineering department, at, at, you know, do a PhD in that. And then after you have the PhD in, in that area, you can do research in fermentation technology. Now, one of the problems of research in general is that you usually want to do something hot, like something that's, you know, otherwise you would do it in industry. So there's not a lot of new research in fermentation technology. There's a lot of research in, in metabolic engineering and synthetic biology for example. So it's how to engineer microorganisms to, to make new things. So that, that is one, that is one route. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. chemical engineering? Yeah. yeah, I think so. So so it's one of the areas, I mean, it depends where you want to live, right? So so that's another thing. Biological, the, what it's called industrial biotechnology is pretty much centered in a few places in the world. So uh, Brisbane is not particularly big. There's a couple of companies that do that, but it's not particularly big. Um, and then if you don't mind where you're going to live, there's, there's a lot of uh, that work in Europe and in the US. And I can give you specific examples if you need them. But there is a lot. There is a lot of that. Um, I would say it depends on the local economy. So, for example, in Queensland, you would get mining engineers and oil engineers and that sort of thing. Is biological engineering more of a research focus or industry-focused area? 
So um, in general, I would say in general it's more academic focused, but that's because the academia has got it has gathered so much attention in academia. Not because there's not a lot of jobs in industry. So there is still, I mean, industrial biotechnology as an industry is actually growing very quickly uh, for production of food materials, supplements, uh, you know, a lot of different things. And now bioenergy is a big, you know, is a big thing. So that's. Yeah, that's separate. That's that's still very interesting, I think. But that's actually more a field type of research. So, and you can work even for oil companies or mining companies that do environmental studies and so on. Uh, a lot of a lot of engineers, what I what they do is they do consulting. So, for example, I do a lot of consulting on my free time, and what that allows you to do is you can work on one area and then and then give expert advice in certain sub areas. So that's pretty, that's pretty much what environmental engineers do because there's really nothing for them to build. There's just more for their knowledge, you know? Yeah. Around this area, you mean geographically? Or am I? Um, I, yeah, I doubt it. I, you know, I don't know of many biofuel production facilities here. I work with Mackay Sugar and they are looking into it, but they are still a sugar producer. Uh, and most, I would say most Queensland based uh, sugar mills are actually a sugar mill. They, they don't do energy. Um, if you do, if you want to do biofuels, pretty much US or Brazil are the main places. Yeah, what you can do is, for example, I mean, I don't know exactly how it works here, but in the U.S. or even in Brazil, I think what you can do is you can have an internship in a company there, and you pretty much go for three months or six months or whatever, and then you have that internship experience. Um, and even if you can't go directly in something that you're going to be doing, you can do something that's associated or related to. So, for example, if you did an internship in a sugar mill, that would be amazingly useful. Even if you, you know, even if you move after and then you do something else later on, if you want to do energy, sugar is pretty much the place to be. And you are in the sugar capital of Australia, so that's good. Yeah. If you're more interested in oil, you said? Um, well, there's everything from the people who do the refining, for example, all, all of those are chemical engineers. So you take the oil and then you do what's called refining. So you make all the products that are made out of oil. So there is a lot of jobs there. Um, there's a few refiners actually in Australia and I work with a couple of them and they are usually very nice people. I mean, they're evil, you know, <laughs> because they work for oil companies, but they are nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but uh, when I was in my PhD, I started a company and with a couple of other people, and that gave me a lot of, well, the company didn't work, which is usually what happens with startup companies. But, uh, <laughs> but the experience, I got the experience from there. And then, um, yeah, and then I applied that to chemical engineering. So I did my undergrad and PhD in chemical engineering. Where did you do your undergrad? Uh, in the University of Texas at Austin. And And my... On my PhD? Uh, at MIT. Um, I was wondering if you knew much about what opportunities there are in other fields, like other biological engineering fields. Um, can you be more specific? Like, what do you mean? Uh, well, you know, other things like. Other than biofuels, you mean? Yeah, other than biofuels. Ah, okay. So, for example, there is usually the biggest market for production, like, if you want to stay in bio, you can go to pharma. So pharmaceutical companies are big employers of chemical engineers, um, and it's bio-related. They are even more evil than oil companies, so I don't know if you want to go there. Uh, no, actually, I, was, I wanted to do pharma, uh, and I, I think it's actually very interesting. And then the other fields are more food-based. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, nutraceutical-based, so things like vitamins and um, those things, there's, it's big. Yeah, that's another big area. I should have mentioned that. It's, not, it's actually not a lot of bio, per se. I mean, you do a little bit of bio, but it's, it's not a lot of bio. And that's actually related to also environmental engineering. Do you know much about biomedical 
Yeah, and that's actually very different. Yeah. So that was a, so one of my 17 majors that I had in undergrad was biological engineering. It, it wasn't 17, but it was something like seven. Um, and what you do in biomedical is more, you, you become pretty much a doctor, but you see medicine from the engineering perspective. Okay. So how do you make new, let's say, material for you know, transplant or a new machine that you know, revives the person sooner or whatever? But, um, yeah. The chemical biology. No, it's more mechanical. It's, more it's, mechanical. Me it's mechanical and biological. Okay. Uh, well, mechanical and medicine, pretty much. And if you are interested in the electrical aspect, then you can do electrical. And, yeah. Chemical is not, not so much. Because we also need to probably leave. No worries.